Janet Briggs. I was diagnosed in 2007 with multiple myeloma, which is a cancer of the bone marrow, and one is a member of one of the evil family of blood cancers. I live in Greensboro, North Carolina. I'm married to my husband, Peter, and I have two children, Nina and Charlie. And Nina is here tonight with her family, her husband, John. This is my family. <laughs> who, lucky for me, just live around the corner from me That's in Greensboro. Me. <laughs> <laughs> my connection to TNT is through my son-in-law, John's sister, Jenny Duberstein, who's over there, who took me as her honor to teammate the year I was diagnosed. One little thing I want to mention about my younger life is that I grew up in the Panama Canal Zone. Every night at 6 o'clock, the DDT truck would come around to spray for mosquitoes, and all of us kids would jump on our bikes and follow the truck, spewing out the clouds of DDT. Of course, we had no idea what it was. I don't think anybody else did either. I have to say, I've always wondered if those great runs behind the, the trucks may have contributed to developing multiple myeloma. Who knows? I guess that's what happens when you get cancer. You try to make sense of it. As I said, I was diagnosed in February 2007. I was being seen because of a blood in my urine, which, by the way, resolved by itself and it never amounted to anything. However, in the process of the workup, of the doc one of the doctors ran a bunch of tests and found an elevated protein in my blood, which prompted a bone marrow biopsy and ultimately a diagnosis of multiple myeloma. In August of 2007, I had a stem cell transplant. It took me about a half a year to recover from that. I lost all my hair, and anyone who has had chemo treatment knows losing your hair can be traumatic. But in time, it grew back, and, and for some amazing reason, it was actually better hair than my original hair. <laughs> a positive effect of the drugs. So after a couple of years, the stem cell transplant was no longer working. The numbers on my labs were creeping up, and with multiple myeloma, it's all about the numbers. I had never had a single symptom of the disease at that point. In October 2009, I was started on Revlimid. Revlimid is a relatively new drug in the multiple myeloma world, and the cool thing about it is that it's not traditional chemo and doesn't involve an infusion. You take it by mouth three weeks out of four, and if you're lucky enough um, to not have any side effects, it's almost like living without cancer. Revlimid lasted for me for about three years. But in January of 2013, Revlimid stopped working, and since then it's been a roller coaster ride. Different treatments have been tried, which they call salvage treatments, a term I never felt particularly comfortable with. You never know if the treatment is going to work. Sometimes it's like going, to, it looks like it's going to, and then it doesn't. <coughs> then there's always the question of whether one can handle the treatment because of the side effects. In April of this year, my latest treatment plan stopped working. Now I'm in a clinical trial and it's touch and go. Still, I'm not sure if I'm gonna be able to tolerate it. One of the main drugs, biggest and most serious side effects, which is often with chemo drugs, is a low blood count. Last week, my white count was down to 0.2, and normal is 1.2 to 7.3. A daughter of a friend of mine actually asked me, does that mean you only have two white cells in your whole body? <laughs> And I don't actually know what it means, but it doesn't sound good. <laughs> so that timeline is basically the story of my disease. The story of my cancer journey, however, really didn't start until January 2013 when the revelment stopped working. That's when the bottom fell out. I was standing in the kitchen. I had just returned from a wonderful trip with my sister-in-law in Naples, Florida. I was tanned and rested and happy. And out of nowhere, bending over a trash can, throwing away some cantaloupe brines, I felt an excruciating pop in my back. Without knowing it right then, I had broken my back in several places. The myeloma had reared its ugly head. <clears throat> These fractures required a kyphoplasty, a surgery where they basically pour cement into the vertebrae to stabilize them, <clears throat> as well as the radiation therapy. In the middle of it all, I ended up in the ICU with septicemia, a severe infection of the blood that is definitely life-threatening. I was suddenly very sick and my world changed. But even though I was very sick and a lot of pain, I would never change that time. 
There's nothing like arriving at death's door to make you appreciate all the love and beauty in life. My voice is shaking because I'm never as best at this. <laughs> During that time, I also came to the real life realization that death is not an emergency. Having a near-death experience is actually very calm and beautiful. In fact, as I came to when I was being admitted to the hospital, I commented to my daughter what an incredibly, incredibly beautiful emergency room they had. <laughs> she asked, what do, you, what do you mean? And I said, well, but ER has some beautiful windows and plants, and I felt like it was in some sort of Buddhist temple. And she answered me by saying, I don't know what emergency room you are in, but that's not where we just were. I suppose I was hallucinating, which is a common, um, common thing with septicemia. That hallucination was the beginning of many more hallucinations in that time period that made us laugh and add celebrity to an otherwise terrifying experience. <coughs> the experience in the ICU really helped me come to terms with knowing I was probably going to die sooner than I would like. And it taught me so much about living in the moment and just trying to relax around the ups and downs of my disease. My recovery period after the crisis was also very calm. I did a lot of contemplating and soul-searching and gave a lot of thought about the attitudes our society has about cancer, illness in general, and dying. No one really wants to talk about cancer and dying or deal with it, but fortunately it is groups like LLS that have brought so much awareness. Cancer is almost now like a household word, and the stigma of the word that existed even when my mother had it in the late 80s has finally begun to fade. It is also, I have also given a lot of thought to the attitudes of cancer centers and healthcare workers. By and large, I had a wonderful group of nurses who treated me. I truly believe they are a special breed of people and I am forever indebted. However, the healthcare system in general does have a lot to learn. For instance, at the cancer center in Greensboro, and I believe in many cancers, there is a tradition of after a patient finishes their treatments, they ring the bell. <clears throat> and the nurses and family stand around and clap. One time someone was ringing the bell and I said to my nurse, well that won't be something I'll ever be doing. And she said, oh, don't say that. You never know what can happen. Well, I'm pretty darn sure I won't be ringing the bell. <clears throat> it got me thinking, how weird it is it that they have a tradition like this, never considering all the people in the room that will never ring the bell. I certainly don't begrudge anyone celebrating finishing their treatments. It's wonderful. But there are many of us sitting in that chemo room that will never ring the bell. Ringing the bell becomes all about the cure. The reality is the cancer is here to stay. I know that people say someday we won't have cancer, but I just read an article recently that said probably not. But anyway, the reality is the cancer is here to stay and many of us are just trying to cope and live with this wretched disease and will probably not live to see a cure. Those of us who have incurable cancers know we are probably going to die sooner than we would like and we have to deal with that on a daily basis. There are also those of us who may have cancer that is technically curable, but they don't get cured. Instead, they die. And out of the hype and emphasis about a cure also comes the language of winning and losing. It's almost like if you don't win the battle, you lose, and that makes you a loser. But I don't feel like a loser. And there's already a lot of guilt that comes with having cancer. Often when a person is diagnosed with cancer, they feel guilty. They feel they've done something wrong, or they've let their families down. The attitude of winning and losing only increases the guilt. One of the brutal things about myeloma is that it never goes away. Although patients are kept alive longer and longer, I will never be without treatment. I have noticed well, that nurses are wonderful, especially with newcomers where there are experts in compassion. The longer you are there receiving your treatments, you eventually become a veteran. I never wanted to be a pro at chemo. Some nurses begin to treat you routinely, rushing you through the process and seeming to forget that the longer you have been treated, the closer you are to dying and the harder it is to tolerate the treatments and the need for compassion is just as strong. I've never done anything close to what you athletes are about to go out and do tomorrow, but it strikes me that having incurable cancer is not unlike doing a triathlon. 
We're all in it for the long haul. It's bound to be full of ups and downs and the unexpected, and it undoubtedly reveals to each of us strengths and fears we never knew we had. I guess I feel really fortunate to have the opportunity and the incentive to look those things so directly in the eye. Good luck to each of you tomorrow. Thank you for looking me in the eye and for not making me feel like a lost cause just because I won't be cured. And thank you for the opportunity to talk to you tonight. It's truly been an honor and it's been a great honor to be Jenny Duberstein's TNT Honor Team Member.